For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Romans 8, verse 13. The apostle having been spoken of justification by Christ, and showed the necessity of sanctification, in which we indeed resemble the holiness of God, which he shows to be wrought by the Spirit of God, which is a band of communion between saints and Christ, who raises them both from sin here and the grave hereafter, and that we are not debtors to the flesh, that we should follow the suggestions of that, but to the Spirit, to observe His inspirations. He then in the text backs His exhortations with a threatening and a promise, a threatening to excite our industry, and a promise to prevent our dejection. You must not imagine you shall be justified without being sanctified. For if you live after the flesh, you shall fall under that eternal death which is due to sin. But if you follow the motions of the Spirit, and endeavor to quench the first sparks of sin, the death of your body shall be an entrance into the happy life of your soul. Some by flesh understand the state under the law, Others more properly corrupted nature. Ye shall die without hopes of a better life. But if you mortify the deeds of the body, the deeds of the body of sin, which is elsewhere called the body of death, the first motions to sin and passionate compliances with sin, which are the springs of corrupt actions, of divers vices. Corrupt nature is called a body here, morally, not physically. It consists of a number of habits, as a body a number of members. Ye shall live. Ye shall live more spiritually and comfortably here, and eternally hereafter. In the words we may observe, number one, a threatening. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Number two, a promise. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. In the promise there is the condition, the reward. In the condition, the act, to mortify, the object, the deeds of the body. The cause, the body, and number two, the effects, the deeds. Number three, the agents, ye and the Spirit, the principle, the Spirit, the last principle, ye, both conjoined in the work, ye cannot do it without the Spirit, and the Spirit will not do it without your concurrence with Him, and your industry in following His motions. From the act we may observe, first, sin is active in the soul of an unregenerate man. His heart is sin's territory. It is there as in its throne before the Spirit comes. Mortification supposes life before and the part mortified. We call not a stone dead, because it never had life. Justification supposes guilt, sanctification filth, mortification life, preceding those acts. Number two, nothing but the death of sin must content a renewed soul. The sentence is irreversible, Die it must. No indulgence to be shown to it. No lighter punishment than death. Not the loss of a member, but the loss of its life. The axe must be laid to the root, and the knife must be held to the throat. The devils are restrained by the power of God from many sins, which cannot therefore be said to be mortified. As nothing but the death of Christ would satisfy the justice of God, So nothing but the death of sin must satisfy the justice of the soul. Number three, do mortify. The time, present. Once observe, if sin must have no pardon, so it must have no reprieve. No such mercy must be extended to it as to give it a moment's breathing. Dangerous enemies must be handled with a quick severity. If we do not presently kill sin, it may suddenly suck out the blood of our soul. Number four, do mortify, notes, a continued act. 
It must be a quick and an uninterrupted severity. The knife must still stick in the throat of sin till it fall down perfectly dead. Sin must be kept down, though it will rage the more, as a beast with the pangs of death is more desperate. From the object observed first, mortification must be universal. Not one deed, but deeds, little and great, must fall under the edge. The brats must be dashed against the wall. Though the main battle be routed, yet the wings of an army may get the victory. There are evil dispositions, depraved habits, corrupt affections. We should not spare a nest of vipers when we find them being all equally injurious. Number two. All actual sins are but the sproutings of original. The body signifies corrupt nature. Deeds are the products of it. All the sparks issue from the furnace within. The body gives nourishment to the members, and the members bring supplies to the body. There are outward and inward deeds, acts of the mind, which, though not acts of the natural body, yet are acts of the body of sin. Galatians 5, verses 19 and 20. Hatred, envyings, acts which the soul may perform separate from the body. Number 3. The greatest object of our revenge is within us. Our enemies are those of our own house, inbred, domestic adversaries. Our anger is then a sanctified anger when set against our own sins. Our enemy has got possession of our souls, which makes the work more difficult. An enemy may be better kept out than cast out when he has got possession. Sin is within us and is always present with us. Romans 7 verse 21 It lies in ambush for us in the best duties and starts out upon every occasion when we would do good. It would cut off all correspondences with heaven. It is in our reason, in our affections. It encamps in us, round about us, and easily besets us. Hebrews 12 verse 1 From the agents, ye the spirit, observe first, man must be an agent in this work. We have brought this rebel into our souls, and God would have us make as it were some recompense by endeavoring to cast it out. Is in the law. The father was to fling the first stone against a blasphemous son. We must not be neuters in this work, nor lookers on. It will not be done without. Though it cannot be done simply by us, it will not be done without our concurrence, though it cannot be done without a supernatural operation. Number two, if ye, all of you, it is a universal duty for the subject as well as the object. Number one, you carnal men, there is no precept given to you to sin, and therefore it is not your duty to sin. The life of sin is your misery, and the mortification of sin is your happiness as well as your duty. You renewed and justified persons, regeneration does not privilege sin or exempt from the mortifying work. Election and consequently the fruits of it, is to holiness, not from it. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Vocation and sanctification, in which mortification is the first step, are perspective glasses to see to the top of election. Though you have mortified, yet still do it. Through the Spirit. Mortification is not the work of nature. It is a spiritual work. Every man ought to be an agent in it, yet not by his own strength. We must engage in the duel, but it is the strength of the Spirit only that can render us victorious. The duty is ours, but the success is from God. We can sin of ourselves, but not overcome sin by ourselves. We know how to be slaves, but are unable to ourselves be conquerors. As God made us first free, so he only can restore us to that freedom we have lost, and does it by his spirit, which is the spirit of liberty. The difficulty of this work is hereby declared. 
The difficulty is manifested by the necessity of the Spirit's efficacy. Not all the powers on earth, nor the strength of ordinances, can do it. Omnipotency must have the main share in the work. The implantation of grace in the heart is called creation. The perfection of grace is called a victory, both belonging to an almighty power. From the promise observed first, heaven is a place for conquerors only. Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne. He that will be sin's friend cannot be God's favorite. The way to eternal life is through conflicts inward with sin, outward with the world. There must be a combat before a victory, and a victory before a triumph. Number two, the more perfect our mortification, the clearer our assurance of glory. The more sin dies, the more the soul lives. The sounder our lives are, the more sensible we are that we do live. The more the enemy flies, the more certainty of an approaching victory. Number three, mortification is a sure sign of saving grace. It is a sign of the Spirit's indwelling and powerful acting, a sign of an approach to heaven. Doctrine. The doctrine to be hence insisted on is this. Mortification of sin is an universal duty, and the work of the Spirit in the soul of a believer, without which there can be no well-grounded expectations of eternal life and happiness. I do not intend a full discourse of mortification, but in pursuance of a former exhortation of resemblance to the holiness of God to which this work is necessary. We cannot resemble God till that which is a hindrance to this resemblance be taken away, and as our deformity is paired off, we come nearer to our original pattern. And therefore I shall only show in short what this mortification is, and how we may judge of ourselves whether we are mortified or not and that without it there can be no hope of heaven. First, what mortification is. It is a break in the league we naturally hold with sin. Since we were upon ill terms with God, we have kept a constant correspondence with his enemy, and the union between sin and the soul is as straight as that between the flesh and the bones, or the flesh and the blood blood being in every part of the flesh, and sin in every part of the soul. In regard of this union, sin is called flesh because of its incorporation with flesh. The union between sin and the soul is naturally as great as the union between Christ and the believer, and expressed by the similitudes of marriage, Romans 7. Body and members, root and branches, as well as the other. It is a political, too, as between king and subjects. Sin is therefore said to have dominion, to make laws, whence we read of the law of the members. In regard of this, mortification is expressed by the term of having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5.11, a breaking of the conjugal knot. The acquaintance and familiar correspondence with sin are broken off. The communion between sin and the soul is at an end. The common interest wherein they were linked together is divided. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence, or with Ephraim, what have I to do any more with idols? Hosea 14.8 It looks now upon its former favorite as an enemy. Sin's yoke that was light is now burdensome. Nothing so much desired as the shaking it off, and that is the object of her antipathy, which before had been the object of the choicest favor. In this regard it is called a denying of lust. Titus 2, verse 12. A stopping the ears against the importunities of it, and refusing all commerce and cohabitation with it. It is also a declaration of open hostility. As leagues between princes are not broken, but a war ensues, the ways of sin are rejected, the dominion of sin opposed, the throne of sin assaulted, 
The soul is in arms to chase out this usurper and free itself from its tyranny, and sin up in arms to reduce its subject to its ancient obedience. And here behold that irreconcilable and tedious war without a possibility of renewing the ancient friendship, and which ends not but with a total conquest of sin. This hostility begins in a bridling corrupt affections, laying a yoke upon anything that would take part with the enemy. It cuts off all the supplies of sin, stops all the avenues to it, which the apostle expresses by making provision for the flesh, Romans 13, verse 14, and so on. A turning the stream which fed sin another way. His anger is a degree of murder, and he that hates his brother is a manslayer. So he that hates sin and proclaims a war against it hath killed it affectu, though not actu. He hath attained one degree of mortification when his anger against it is irreconcilable, like the anger of those that quarrel about a crown which cannot be ended but by the death of one of the pretenders. Number three, a strong and powerful resistance by using all the spiritual weapons against sin which the Christian armory will afford. The list of which magazine we have in Ephesians 6, 13, and 14, and so on. It's a hearing of the word, setting his sin in the front, that the arrows of God may pierce it to the heart, and a two-edged sword may cut the sinews of it asunder, improving baptism, which is a burial with Christ, to which in the apostle mentions in Romans 6, 2, and 3, Sending up strong cries for the assistance of heaven, as Paul did when he had that thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12.7, redoubling his messages to heaven for a quick supply. The apostle expresses this reluctancy against sin by two emphatical words, 1 Corinthians 9.27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. I keep under... The word signifies to take hold of or to grip an adversary, as wrestlers do when they would give their antagonist a fall, and lay him flat with the earth, or to beat and pound as wrestlers anciently did with their plummets of lead. The word is derived from this in the text, and it signifies putrefied wounds. And the other word signifies to lead captive, to subject the body to serve God, not lusts, to lead it as a slave, not to endure it as a master, a bringing the affections into order, that they may not contradict and disobey the motions of the spirit and sanctified reason. Number four, a killing of sin expressed in the text by mortifying or putting to death. In Colossians 3, verse 5, by mortify, The word signifies to reduce to a carcass, that though, like a carcass, it may retain the shape, liniments, and members that had it living, yet it has not the life, strength, and motion it had before. And it is called a crucifying, Galatians 5.24, which comprehends all the acts which preceded the crucifying of Christ, which was done with the greatest spite, as much as could be. The same measures, the same proportions, the same eagerness of spirit are observed. A total deafness to the cries and complaints of sin is that of the Jews to the groans of the Lord of life, a crucifying it, notwithstanding all it would give in exchange. It is called in scripture by the name of revenge, which ends not without the destruction of the hated person and sometimes not with it. Every day there is to be a driving a new nail into the body of death, a breaking some limb or other of it, till it doth expire. Number two. The second thing is how we may judge of our mortification. First, negatively. All cessation from some particular sin is not a mortification. A non-commission of a particular sin is not an evidence of the mortification of the root of it. Indeed, a man cannot commit all kinds of sin at a time, nor in many years. 
The commands of sin are contrary, and many masters commanding contrary things cannot be served at one and the same time. Pride commands to lavish, and covetousness to hoard. All sins have their times of reigning in a wicked man, as all graces have their particular seasons of acting according to the opportunities God gives. Has Hael abhorred the thoughts of that cruelty the prophet foretold that he should act? What? Am I a dog? Second Kings 8, 12, and 13. Yet that sin lay hid by him as Joash by Jehoiada, hoping for the time to play his part and act Haziel as a slave to it. The cessation of a member from motion at present is no argument either of the death of the body or the mortification of that member. A cessation from one sin may be but an exchange. It may be a divorce from a sin odious to the world, and an embrace in another that has more specious pretenses as a man may forsake one harlot and fall in league with another. Some sins do not so much affright the conscience, and those may be entertained when a frowning conscience scares a man from some more abominable. Lusts are various. Titus 3, verse 3. A man may cast off the service of one master and list himself in the service of another. He changes his Lord without changing his servility. A man cannot be said to be clean because he has risen out of one sink to drench himself in another. The cessation may be from some outward gross acts only, not from a want of will to sin. Did not some log lie in the way? There may be speculative pride, ambition, covetousness, uncleanness, when they are not externally acted, which is more dangerous, as infectious diseases are when they are hindered by cold, from a kindly eruption, and strike inward to the heart, and so prove mortal. The pollutions of the world may be escaped when the pollutions of the heart remain, a man may be a fine, garnished, and swept house, and yet an habitation for seven devils worse than reigned there before. The apostle's command for cleaning reaches to the filthiness of the spirit as well as that of the flesh. Second Corinthians 7, verse 1 We say of the soul, so we may say of sin, the bias of the soul may run strongly to that sin and affection and pleasure from the outward acts of which it abstains. It is most dangerous for the house when the fire burns inward. A man may be sooner cured of an outward scald than an inward heat, which when it comes to a hectic fever is incurable. It may be a cessation from sin merely because of the alteration of the constitution. Every age hath particular sins which it inclines men to. Some sins are more proper to young men, which the apostle calls therefore youthful lusts. Second Timothy 2 verse 22 Lust reigns in young men, but its empire decays in an old withered body. Some plants which grow in hot countries will die in colder climates. Ambition decays in age when strength is wasted, but sprouts up in a young man who hath hopes to live many years and make a flourish in the world. A present sickness may make an epicure nauseate the dainties which he would before rake even in the sea to procure. There is a cessation from acts of sin, not out of a sense of sin, but a change of the temper of his body. Number four. A cessation from acts of sin may be forced by some forethoughts of death, some pang of conscience, apprehension of hell, present sense of some scripture threatening, or some sharp and smarting affliction, some signal judgment of God inflicted upon one or other of the companions in sin which are all of themselves but a kind of force, they be in the scourges wherewith God sometimes lashes a man from the present act of sin. As a present pain is one part of the body, it may take away a man's stomach to his food, but when the pain is removed, his appetite returns to him. 
So while a man is upon the rack, and God accusing him, he takes no pleasure, tastes no sweetness in sin. But after these horrors are off, he feeds as heartily as before, nay, sometimes hath a greater stomach, as men after a fit of sickness eat more plentifully to recover the strength which before they lost by the distemper. Number five, a cessation from acts of sin may be for lack of an occasion, for lack of time, place, and materials. A man's will is not against sin, but he wants an opportunity. This is not from mortifying grace within, but from a provincial operation of God in withholding the materials necessary for the commission of sin. Who will say the sins of drunkenness, gluttony, and oppression committed by men on earth are mortified in them when they are in hell? They lack materials, not a nature nor an affection to commit the same, were they again upon earth. Grace lies idle many times for lack of objects to exercise itself about. So does lust in the heart, like a snake starved with cold, till heated by a temptation. A man's condition in the world is not a sign of this mortification. There may be grasping and ambitious thoughts in a cottage. Prodigality may be in a poor man's wishes, though not in his power. Yea, and sometimes there is more prodigality in a poor man's unnecessary expense of a penny than in another throwing away a pound. Restraints from sin are not mortification of it. Men may be curbed when they are not changed. And there is no man in the world but God doth restrain him from more sins, which he hath a nature to commit, than what he doth actually commit. He often hedges up the way with thorns, when execution of the sinful motions, when he does not root out the wickedness that lies secretly in the nature it was an act of God's providence to restrain Abimelech. Genesis 20, verse 6. I withheld thee from sinning against me. These restraints are mercies God would have us bless him for, but not evidences of mortifying grace. Mortification is always from an inward principle in the heart. Restraints from an outward. A restraint is merely a pull back as a man is hindered from doing a mischief by a stronger power. But the mortification is from a strength given, a new metal put into the soul, both a courage and strength to resist it. There is a strength in the inward man, Ephesians 3.16. In a renewed man, there is something beside bare considerations to withhold him, something of antipathy which heightens and improves those considerations in which the soul is glad of them, because the edge and dint of them is against sin. Whereas a man barely restrained would fain stop the entrance of such thoughts, or when they are entered would turn them out of doors again. They are things merely put into him that have no welcome, neither do they change the will. But, Put a little stop to alter the method of proceedings. Mortifying grace finds something in the nature, as there is in the nature of a fountain, to work out the mud when dirt is cast in to infect it. True mortification proceeds from an anger with and a hatred of sin, whereas restraints are from a fear of the consequences of sin. As a man may love the wine, which is as yet too hot for his lips, but mortification proceeds from an anger, a desire of revenge. Hence sin is called an abomination to a good man, as well as to God, which indicates an intense and well-heated anger. It is not only a passionateness, which upon some disappointment in sin, or a tasting the bitterness of it, may be vented against it, which is short-lived and quickly allayed, as a sea after a storm, but it is a rooted revenge, which is the sweetest passion, and accomplished by many projects and contrivances. A man tastes a sweetness in giving blow after blow to sin, as before he took a pleasure in, 
and had friendship with it. Mortification is a voluntary rational work of the soul. Restraints are not so. The devil hath nothing of his nature altered, but has as strong an inclination to sin as ever. Though the act he intends is often hindered by God, as in the case of Job, his malice was as great before to do him a mischief, but God puts a bar upon him and refuses him a license. Job 1 verse 10 Now if that grace which hinders be no more than what a devil hath, it no more argues a man mortified than the devil's forbearance of sin argues him mortified in recovering his angelical state. Number two, we may judge of our mortification positively when upon a temptation that did usually excite the beloved lust, it does not stir. It is a sign of a mortified state. As it is a sign of the clearness of a fountain, when after the stirrings of the water the mud does not appear. Peter's sin seems to be self-confidence, but it was a sign of a greater mortification of it, that when Christ pressed him to declare his love in that demand, John 21:15, Loveth thou me more than these? He would not vaunt his love to Christ to be greater than the rest of his brethren's. His answer goes no further than, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, without adding more than these. As it is with a man that is sick, set the most savory meat before him, which before he had a value for, if he cannot taste it, and his appetite be not provoked by the sight, it is an argument of the strength of his distemper, and where it is lasting, of his approaching death. So when a man has a temptation to sin, decked and garnished with all the allurements the devil can dress it with, and he has no stomach to close with it, it is a sign of a mortified frame. It is a sign of the power of sin when upon the fair offer it makes and the alluring baits it lays, the affections to it are presently stirred. It is an evidence of a co-naturality and a mighty agreement between that sin and the heart, when upon every spark it takes fire. It is a sign a man was filled with all unrighteousness, and had not only a few loose corns about him, so on the contrary, when upon the least motion of temptation, that was like to have the gates open for it, the affections rise against it, and upon the least alarm all run to the walls to defend them and forbid the entrance. It is an evidence of the weakness of that lust that kept before a correspondence with such temptations, and the greater evidence it is when the temptation is high and yet vigorously resisted, as when a spring tide is high and blown in with the wind, it is an argument of the strength and firmness of the bank to keep it out from entering upon the ground, whereas when a man is carried away by every temptation, as marsh ground is drowned at every tide, it is a sign that there is no mortifying grace at all, but a great friendliness between sin and the heart. None will question the deadness of that tree at the root, which doth not bud upon the return of the spring sun, nor need we question the weakness of that corruption which doth not stir upon the presenting a suitable temptation. When we meet with few interruptions and in duties of worship, the multitude of such diversions and an easiness to comply with them is a sign of an unmortified frame, as it is a sign of much weakness in a person and the strength of his distemper when he is not able to hold fast anything or when the least blow or jog makes him let go his hold. In duty we are to lay fast hold on God, Hebrews 6.18, and join ourselves to the Lord, Isaiah 56, 3. It is a weak union when every puff of wind is able to separate us. When the starting of sin in us doth easily turn us from our course, it argues either our credulity to believe its enticements, or our affections to love its allurements, and also the fourth and strength of sin, as a frequent starting of an enemy from woods and fastnesses to obstruct our passage, is a sign of some strength remaining. 
and of more than some few scattered troops, rather some well-bodied army, the more there is of a man's self, flesh, unspiritualness in any service, the more there is of an unmortified temper. The sprouting up of such fruits argues much juice and sap at the root, especially when the eruptions of sin are more numerous and vigorous and the resistance is of them. But when the heart can run its race in a service with some freedom, and the interruptions from the flesh are few and languishing, it is a sign it has met with a weakening wound. They are rather gasps of corruption than any strong attempts. Thirdly, when we bring forth the fruits of the contrary graces, it is a sign sin is mortified. It is to this end that sin is killed by the Spirit, that fruit may be brought forth to God. The more sweet and full fruit a tree bears, the more evidence there is of the weakness of those suckers which are about the root to hinder its generous productions. Believers are called vines and olives planted in a fair soil. And God, the husbandman, who waters and dresses, prunes and cuts off the luxuriant branches that he may have fruit, and fruit meet for him, John 15, 1 and 2. The more fruit is brought forth, the greater sign that the soul is purged, and whatsoever is an enemy to that fruit is cut off and weakened. The more nature doth rise to the exercise of acts proper to it, the more strength of the disease that oppresses it is wasted. Every exercise of grace is both a discovery of the weakness of sin and a fresh blow given to it for the wounding of it. Part 3 The reasons why there can be no expectation of eternal life without mortification of sin are, first, an unmortified frame is unsuitable to a state of glory. There must be a meetness for a state of glory before there can be an entrance into it, Colossians 1, verse 12. Vessels of glory must be first seasoned with grace. Conformity to Christ is to fit us for heaven. He descended to the grave, and there laid his infirmities before he ascended into heaven. So our sins must die before our souls can mount. It is very unsuitable for sin's drudges to have a saint's portion. A fleshly state is unfit for a spiritual life. All men are under the power of the devil, or under the power of Christ. The world lies under the power of the devil. 1 John 5, verse 19 He that has a wicked spirit ruling in him, and not cast out, with all his accomplices, by the Spirit of God, cannot hope to have a friend's privilege, but an enemy's punishment. A fleshly palate cannot relish an heavenly life. Matthew 16, verse 23 Thou savorest not the things that be of God, where there is no savor of God in this world, but only of what is contrary to God, there cannot be a savor of Him in another world. Every vessel must be emptied of its foul water before it can receive that which is clean. No man pours rich wine into old casks. Number two, God cannot in any wise delight in an unmortified soul. To delight in such would be to have no delights in himself and in his own nature. The less the degrees of our mortification, the less God doth delight in us. He has no pleasure in wickedness. The more mains, diseases, rottenness any have, the less pleasure there is. Sin is a mire. The more miry we are, the less can God embrace us. Psalm 5.4 It is a plague. The more it spreads, the less will he be conversant with us. The more of a swinish, viperous, serpentine nature the less of God's affections. Sin represents us more monstrous in God's eyes than the filthiest thing in the world can do in man's. To keep sin alive is to defend it against the will of God and to challenge the combat with our Maker. Number three, unmortified sin is against the whole design of the gospel and death of Christ. As though the death of Christ were intended to indulge us in sin and not to redeem us from it. 
that sin would die was the end of Christ's death. Rather than sin should not die, Christ would die himself. It is in high disesteem of Christ to preserve the life of sin in spite of the death of the Redeemer. And if we defend what he died to conquer, how can we expect to enjoy what he died to purchase? It is a contempt of his death, not to look after that mortifying grace, which was the purchase of so deep a passion. The grace of the gospel of God doth more especially teach this lesson, Titus 2, verse 4, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Grace in God was the motive to him, not to account the blood of Christ too dear for us, and therefore should teach us not to account the blood of our sins too dear for him. The tenor of the gospel is that a man without mortification has no interest in Christ, and therefore no right to glory. Psalm 5, verse 4. It is an inseparable character of them that are Christ's, that they have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. In other words, they are Christ's that are under the power of his death, not they that only hold the opinion of his death or they are Christ's that are truly planted into the likeness of his death. Romans 6, verse 5. Part 4. Application of Exhortation. Let us labor to mortify sin. If we will not be the death of sin, sin will be the death of our souls. Though the allurements of sin may be pleasant, the propositions seemingly fair, yet the end of all is death. Romans 5, verse 21. Death was threatened by God and executed upon Adam. Death must be executed upon our sins in order to the restoration of the eternal life of our souls. Love to everlasting life should provoke us. Fear of everlasting death should excite us to this. The two most solemn and fundamental passions that put us upon action, why will you die, was God's expostulation, Ezekiel 33.11. Why should thou, O my soul, for a short vanishing pleasure, venture in eternal death, should be our expostulation with ourselves. This would be a curing our disease, bringing our soul into that order in part which was broken by the fall. By this a power of that tyrant that first headed and maintained the faction against God would be removed and the soul recovered that liberty and life it lost by disobeying of God. This would conduce to our peace. We have then a sprouting assurance when we are most victorious over our lusts. After every victory, God gives us a taste of the hidden manna. Revelation 2 verse 17 Unmortified lusts do only raise storms and tempests in the soul. Less pains are required to the mortification of them than to the satisfaction of them. Sin is a hard task, master. There must be a pleasure in destroying so cruel an inmate. Gratitude engages us. God's holiness and justice bruised Christ for us. And shall not we kill sin for him? An infinite love parted with a dear son, and shall not our shallow, finite love part with destroying lusts? We cannot love our sin so much as God loved his son. He loved him infinitely. If God parted with him for us, shall not we part with our sins for him? He would have us kill it, because it hurts us. The very command discovers affection as well as sovereignty, and minds us of it, is our privilege as well as our duty, and to engage us to it, he has sent as great a person to help us, as to redeem us, namely his spirit. He sent one to merit it, the other to assist us in it, and work it in us, who is to bring back the creature to God by conquering that in it, which has so long detained it captive. And therefore to this purpose, number one, implore the help of the spirit. Whenever we set seriously upon this work at any time, let us apply ourselves to the Spirit of God as one in office to this end, as being a spirit of holiness, not only in his nature, but in his operations. Ephesians 1.13, Romans 1.4 
The Father and the Son are not so often called holy as the Spirit, who is called the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. Not that he is more holy than the other persons, but in regard of his office to work holiness in the hearts of men. As Jehoshaphat, upon the assault from the enemy, cried unto God for deliverance, so upon any arming of our corruptions we should cry to the Spirit for assistance. He doth as much delight to be our auxiliary on earth as Christ doth to be our advocate in heaven. The neglects of application to him are the cause of our miscarriages. We are half persuaded to ascend before we beg strength against it. Number 2. Listen to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to convince by shaking the soul out of its carnal lethargy. As the Spirit gives a strong alarm at the first conversion, in which the soul sees the strength of its enemy and the greatness of its danger, its own impotency and inability to contest with it, So upon carrying on the degrees of mortification, there are various alarms to put us upon a holy watchfulness against the projects of sin. Listen to these convictions which come in by the word, which is the ministration of the spirit, and in respect to the spiritual energy of it, is called spirit. John 6.53 Thirdly, plead the death of Christ. The end of his death was to triumph over sin as to take away the guilt of sin. He was the righteousness of God. So to take away the dominion of sin, he is the power of God. His expiation of sin and his condemnation of it were twisted together in his sacrifice. Romans 8, verse 3. For sin, or a sacrifice for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. And the consideration of his death and the end of it would inflame us to desire not to be under the power of a condemned malefactor. A consideration of his death and that sin had his hands and brood in his blood would awaken our love to him and an indignation against his enemy. Number four. Let us often think of divine precepts. The frequent meditation on the law of God would excite our endeavors after a principle more conformable to the purity of that law. God's commands establish not men's humors, neither do they gratify men's lusts, but are suited to the holy nature of God, a conformity to which ought to be our aim in mortification. Number five, let us be jealous of our own hearts. Venture not to breathe in corrupt air, for fear of infection. There is a principle in the heart naturally disposed to take fire upon the spark of a temptation. A strict watch in a city hinders foreign correspondence in intestine treachery. Number six, let us often think deeply of the corruption of our natures, how loathsome it is to God, and this will make it loathsome to us. The more it is abominated, the more it is mortified. The supplies of it are cut off, its attempts discovered. When Paul considered his misery by the body of death, it strengthened his resolution of serving God with the law of his mind. Romans seven twenty four and 25, which must needs be accompanied with a strong resistance of the law of his members. Number seven, let us bless God for whatsoever mortifying grace we have received, though never so little. When we pay him in praise what we receive of him, It is a way to have more from him. David grew hot against Nabal after he had received his churlish answer, 1 Samuel 25, and resolved the murder of the whole family, which he had no authority to do. But God prevents him by Abigail's intercession. He blesses God for the success of it and hindering his intentions. And as God prevented his sin... So after his thanksgiving, he took away the occasion of his evil resolution by calling Nabal ten days after into another world, verse 38, and gives him further occasion of praise, verse 39. A little strength owned as a gift of God shall be backed with more. Praising God for what we receive, as well as praying for what we want, is a means to promote the mortification of our sins in order to eternal life.